to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. Today, we get to bring you some knowledge bombs from one of the coolest guys I've met in the Air Force, Captain Johnny Jopling. He's a 31 Papa, a security forces officer. Real quick, I'm going to drop some stats on you. In the interview that we do, we talk about how big the career field is, and we couldn't remember at the time. We didn't have the numbers written down. There are 38,000 security forces airmen across the total force, less than 800 officers. <laughs> Which is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so not a huge amount of them. I've worked with a few, but not a whole lot. And they have a huge responsibility, as we'll get into the, in the interview. I really enjoyed sitting down with Johnny. He's a guy I stay in touch with. You know, there are a couple throughout your career that you'll meet and you're like, I'm going to stay in touch with this guy. Yeah. And he's definitely one of those. Really enjoyed having him on. Yeah, learned a whole bunch from Johnny, appreciated his experience, not just his experience, but his ability to communicate his experience, the things that he's seen and done, the incredible importance of the security forces mission, protecting the base. We'll get into all of that in the interview, but yeah, very much appreciated everything that Johnny had to say. Awesome. With that, let's turn it over to the interview. Welcome back to the podcast. Today, I'm joined by my good friend, Captain Johnny Jopling. Johnny, I am super happy you're joining me today. It has been too long, brother. I hope you're doing well. It has. I'm excited to be here, and thanks for having me. Yeah. So today, you're going to elucidate a career field we've all seen, right? Every single person who's approached a United States Air Force installation has seen this career field. But I don't know a whole lot about it outside of what you and I have talked about. You and I met at OTS. We were both flight commanders. And we shared a cube, cube wall, basically, right up there in Cube City. And man, we had some good times. But honestly, I didn't delve into enough about what your career field is and what it means and how it fits into the broader Air Force. So I'm looking forward to having you come on today and talking about it. So why don't we start off with who is Johnny Jopling? Where are you from? How'd you commission? Where do you go to school? All that kind of stuff. And we'll just get to it from there. Okay. Yeah. Once again, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm from Louisiana. You probably can't tell by the accent, and I get that a lot, but I was born in Monroe, which is the northeast part of Louisiana. Graduated from high school here, and then I went down to actually Baton Rouge Community College for a semester. My grades didn't reflect what LSU wanted. They were good grades, but because of standardized testing scores, um, and that'll kind of go into some of the philosophies that I talk about later and then about just sure. kind of owning and, and not accepting no for an answer. I did a semester there went over to LSU for a year, and I actually ended up transferring back up to the University of Louisiana at Monroe. So let me go back a little bit because um, I was really looking for something more than myself. You know, I grew up, I'm one of four boys. I was always playing sports, mainly baseball and soccer. So all team related things. And I was really looking for that. And I had a very big draw to the military simply because it was going above and beyond. And it was also working with other people to accomplish something bigger than ourselves. I always enjoyed the challenging aspects of team sports because there is that aspect of personal responsibility and coming together with other people who are, you know, they have the same goal, they have the same mission, they have the same objectives, and uh, you're putting all those things together collectively. So that's what initially drew me into the ROTC program. And then what kept me there was the people because I was like, man, this Air Force thing, I'm not real sure. And then I found out about pararescue, which that initially really got my ears perked up to. So kind of the full swing, the long story short is that I actually ended up transferring back up to ULM and I actually commissioned out of Louisiana Tech. That was the crosstown agreement with the University of Louisiana at Monroe. Okay. So I graduated from ULM, but I commissioned out of Louisiana Tech. Got it. Okay. So you said pararescue was kind of the thing that, you know, kind of piqued your interest. Was that what you were originally shooting for or did you choose security forces over that? Or how did you kind of settle on the security forces AFSC? Yeah. So, you know, once again, kind of growing up in an all boys home, it's all 
guns and shooter games and, you know, all this kind of thing. And so that was just a big draw right there. And I knew that law enforcement, you know, I like the idea of what they did, just like I like the idea of what the military did. And you really don't know until you meet someone, you start having those conversations. And even whenever I was in high school, I was having conversations with some of my dad's friends who had been in the military. I specifically remember talking to one of his friends who was a Navy SEAL, and Mm -hmm. he was telling me about the teams and some of that mentality. And I was just enthralled by what he was saying and the camaraderie that he spoke about and the challenges that they dealt with, but how they came out better after those challenges and how they accomplished their missions. Mm -hmm. And so that really pushed me to lean more towards special operations. And I actually went to selection and I was not picked up. I was dropped for not making a run time. Okay. That surprises me, by the way. John, yeah, Johnny's well, wicked fast. <laughs> well, it's actually funny because, you know, I look back at it and I'm like, man, if this was, you know, a year later, yeah, I feel like the story would have been rewritten. But with that said, security forces was on my list. I was getting a degree in criminal justice, but I was shooting for a pararescue. Well, at the time, security forces was understaffed. It was undermanned. Mm-hmm. And so they would not allow me to go back through selection eventually the Air Force did the right thing. And how I saw it is that now they have an obligation that if you want to go try out for a special operations career field within the uh, Air Force, then you're allowed to do that regardless of the Manning document or, you know, kind of where your career field is standing at now. So, you know, kind of the long story short is that I ended up going to security forces and stuck with it ever since. Nice. Okay. So you graduated, you commissioned, you dropped security forces. Let's start there. What does officer training look like for security forces airmen? Maybe how is that different or is it the same as what, you know, your enlisted get? And kind of like, what is security forces? Again, we kind of hit it at the top, right? We all see those gate guards. We hand them our IDs. We salute smartly. We head on in. But it's bigger than that. It's got to be. So let's start with tech training. Let's start with tech school. And then let's start getting into some of the mission aspects. Sure. So just starting off from the tech school aspect, Ours is about six months long, whereas our counterpart, the Enlisted Security Forces School, is, if I remember correctly, it's about three or three and a half. Oh, okay. So we have a little bit extra training. And more specifically, we do a lot of small team tactics or small unit tactics. Mm -hmm. And really, you know, I look back on that. It's not so much about the tactics. It's about, you know, learning how to lead because throughout the school, you know, you're put into leadership positions. So you know, week one, Reed might be the class leader. And then week two, Johnny might be the class leader. And it just rotates like that. And so throughout the process, very similar to how we ran OTS, you know, you have a class leader who prepares a class and dismisses the class and you have flight leaders and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's how this is ran. So the emphasis really is on tasks because there are tests and there are specific graded events that you have to pass. But there's also a very big push for leading and leading in a stressful environment. Okay. And that's probably the biggest thing that I could say that is different from the technical aspect of our enlisted counterpart, Mm -hmm. that leading and leading well is pressed upon very heavily. And, you know, just to, I know that he's a Lieutenant Colonel now, Lieutenant Colonel Weish was our course chief at the time. He was a captain and he was a Purple Heart recipient Mm -hmm. along with another major now who's actually an ALO. Just amazing people, amazing leaders. We had a few Ranger tabs who were, you know, Air Force military members who had uh, passed through Ranger selection. And so they were Ranger qualified. Mm -hmm. So it was a very heavy emphasis in the leadership regards to what we're doing and how we operated day in and day out. So would you say then that the enlisted training is more technically focused? You know, are they going to get, for example, qualified on different weapons that you aren't qualified on or restraint techniques or things of that nature? Or yeah, help me out with that. Yeah. So you hit the nail on the head with the first part is that, you know, their focus is the technical aspect. You know, the things that whenever you come up to a senior airman or that A1C and you say, you know, what's the range on this M4 and what's the effective range on an area target or a point target, they're going to be able to tell you those things. And even though we learn them, they're experts at those things. And so once again, you know, in order to be a good leader, you have to be a good follower. But at their stage, all they know is that I have one job to do, and it might just be manning this weapon system, or it might be guarding this gate, but I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. Mm -hmm. And so that's where you start to see this big shift. And it just goes into the responsibility aspect of where the, where the progression goes of an airman in their careers. Okay. Where is technical training for you guys? I believe it's still 
at in San Antonio at Camp Bullis. It's okay. a little annex, so it's not directly on Lackland Air Force Base or Medina, which Medina is across the road from Lackland. We do some training at both of those locations, but we're actually housed on Camp Bullis, which is just north, I believe. Not just north. It's about a 30-minute drive. Okay. So for the enlisted, they don't get to travel all that far then, huh? You know, they graduate basic and then just kind of drive up the road and they're at training, that, huh? That's exactly <laughs> it. Which, I mean, it can be a double-edged sword because, you know, whenever I commissioned, I drove up to Montana, which was, you know, 25 hours. And then three weeks later, I drove right back down to Texas. I was like, well, I could have just parked in tech yeah. anyways. <laughs> that's the Air Force for you, though, right? That's it. Yeah. So you graduated from training. Where was your first assignment? What were you doing there? What was the mission that you had? Yeah, so first assignment was in Malmstrom Air Force Base in Great Falls, Montana. If you haven't heard of Malmstrom, you probably think it's in Germany. Most people, you know, most people think <laughs> that's that, fair. Oh, yeah. that's Germany, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's intercontinental ballistic missiles there. The really focus is on the deterrence mission, which is part of Air Force Global Strike Command. And there's also the law enforcement side, which encompasses our weapon storage area and some other capabilities. But the real focus is the missile field. And because it's a very unique mission, you know, Basically, I'm probably jumping ahead of myself, but you actually post out with your guys. So with 45 to 60 of your enlisted counterparts, and you're generally the only officer out in the missile field. There are three different squadrons, and you're going to man one of them with your teams. You live in different locations, and you know, as the officer, you're going around and you're making sure that your enlisted counterpart are doing what they need to do. They're getting the training that they need to get and that everything is you know, safeguarded as it's supposed to be. Okay, so let me just run this down. I think on paper and on the face of it, it may seem a little absurd to some folks. You got a 22, 23 year old college graduate with six months of training leading, you know, between 40 to 60, 18 to 20 year olds, all of them with weapons. And you're guarding intercontinental ballistic missiles in Montana. I just want to make sure I got that. I got that all right. Is that <laughs> that that is that is exactly correct. And that is to include more than a handful of up armored Humvees and also automatic grenade launchers. OK, so, yes. Yeah. OK, so we're going to get to this at the end. But the leadership challenge there, I'm already seeing it. That's something a lot of us don't face pretty early. You know, like you guys do. You guys start leading right from the jump. That's really interesting. Yeah, it is. And, you know, I have so many stories. I did not have a great master sergeant. He was a master sergeant. That was his rank, but he was my flight chief going off. And so, you know, you don't know what you don't know whenever you start off in the big blue. Yeah. And so I kind of had to learn like, oh, this guy is not respected. This guy isn't doing a lot of things right because, you know, I had some great examples and I knew what leadership was, but applying that leadership directly to the job sometimes looks different. Sometimes you have to make adjustments because of certain missions require certain skill sets or they require, you know, certain things to be changed for the Air Force or for security procedures. And you just think, oh, well, that's just normal because of that. Whenever in reality, that's not normal. Yeah, so okay. there are some very interesting challenges that up and down the chain that you see in that environment. You know, Johnny, I know you and I counseled all of our cadets at OTS. Find a good senior NCO. Yes. A good senior NCO can set you on the path. And if you don't have a lot of site pictures on what that can look like, you know, that can be a real big challenge, you know, until you figure out, wait a minute, I've been following the senior NCO and he or she's not firing on all cylinders or whatever, you know, that can be tough. Yeah. And, you know, just to kind of piggyback on that, I'm still uh, good friends. I'm not going to use his name, but he's a senior master sergeant now. Yeah. And he's only about 15 years into his career. So if, if you know kind of the rank structure, he's burning pretty fast. He will more than likely be wearing feathers at some point in his career. And I can call him up today and he'd answer the phone. And yeah. that's because, like you said, you find one and you don't let them go because they're better than gold in many, many circumstances. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So how long was your assignment there at Malmstrom before we met each other up at OTS? I actually didn't finish my full assignment. So officer training school was on the hot job list. And, you know, and this is where personal responsibility plays into it. I was frustrated, honestly, while I was in Montana. I wanted, personally, I wanted to deploy. I wanted more experience. I wanted these things. And at the time, Global Strike Command, especially Northern tier bases that had ICBMs as a primary mission, they were quote unquote deployed in place. Yeah. So you would get stuck there for three years and possibly a fourth year. And I was honestly 
almost looking for a way out. And I probably allowed emotion to drive even my decision to go. But with that said, it was the best thing that, that ever happened to me because otherwise I wouldn't be who I am today without the experience of OTS. So I was in Montana for two and a half years. So I knew now Lieutenant Colonel, I'm not going to use his name, but he was our DO whenever I first showed up. Yep. Yep. First name starts with a K. Yep, gotcha. And yep. so I knew him from ROTC at LSU, and I made a phone call to him and said, hey, I'm interested in this. What do you think? And he said, I can talk to the boss. It shouldn't be an issue. And I trusted him from whenever I was at LSU because whenever, like I said before, whenever I was at LSU, I had to earn my way there, but I also earned a scholarship, an express, a type two scholarship via mm. ROTC. Okay. And those are competitive if you know anything about them but I worked hard for it and, you know, I earned it. And through that process, he was mentoring me and helping me along the way, kind of to understand the air force. And he saw that in me. And so, and I kept our connection. He actually commissioned me at Louisiana tech. That's so, outstanding. That's so cool. So it comes full circle. And I kind of hate now that I didn't mention all this earlier, but you know, it's, <laughs> you don't even really think about it. Yeah, but, yeah. So I called him. Well, I didn't call him. I think that I just saw his name down there and I was like, oh, wow. And yeah. so I looked at the hot job list and I said, hey, I'm going to do it. And he said, well, I'm going to let the boss know that you're coming. And he had a conversation with another lieutenant colonel who was our boss. Yep. And yeah, the rest is kind of history. So I arrived in Montana, December of 2013, went to training until about May of 2014. And then mm -hmm. I was there from May of 2014 until May of 2016. Got it. Yep. And I PCSed in to Maxwell in March of 16. So you were just a couple yep. months behind me. That's right. And yeah, and that's where we met. Had a great, for me, 27 months. You know, I left a little bit early because yep. I was also selected for that internship down in the DC area. Man, we had some good times. And we won't bore the audience with too many of our OTS stories. <laughs> We've shared a bunch of them before. But after OTS, you know, where do you find yourself today and what are you doing and kind of what led you there? So while I was at OTS, I basically had the decision and, and it came down to leadership as everything does. And, you know, my question was, hey, am I going to leave here and go back to a career field that I've seen a lot of problems? You know, and when I say problems, I'm not just saying that from my perspective. I'm saying I saw, you know, promises or, you know, people say things are going to happen and they didn't happen. And one example that I vividly remember, I had a, a friend who he was a little bit older. He was a prior maintenance NCO. He commissioned through ROTC, and then we showed up at, in Montana together, and we were kind of thick as thieves. We went through tech school, and then we were also stationed together. He's still in right now. And, you know, basically, we were just taking care of each other, you know, throughout. We worked in tandem with one another. We didn't post out together because you don't do that. But, yeah. you know, whenever he was gone, I was here. Whenever I was gone, he was here, that type thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, he had a family. I remember one Christmas, he was supposed to be working, and I said, Hey man, I'm more than happy to cover for you if you want to stay home with your family. Because at the time I was single, I didn't have a family. He had a wife and a few small kids. Yeah. And I said, uh, and also I'll pitch it to my flight that if you have anyone on your flight who's in the same predicament, you know, I think that they would be more than happy to help that out. And then maybe, you know, later on down the road, they can make it right. I said, I'm not worried about it, man. I, I just want you to be able to have that opportunity yeah. with this Christmas. Well, you know, we just did it. We just made it happen. And lo and behold, the, squadron commander came down on him and had a very direct and pointed conversation with him, but he never had it with me. And I found that very odd because it wasn't him just making a decision. Yeah. We agreed to this and we also agreed to it with our flights to do that. And, and basically it was like, if your flight's going to be out there, you need to be out there. And where I understand that and I respect it because I am, hey, lead from the front. You're not going to not do something that you ask someone else to do. Yeah, if you ask someone yeah. to take out the trash, you better be willing to take out the trash. Yep. If you ask someone to scrub a toilet, you better be scrubbing a toilet. But in this case, we specifically set it up to where his flight had the same opportunity that he did. And yeah. so we both said, hey, yeah, we're good with this. And, and I respect him as a leader. So it wasn't a leadership issue there. But I was very just disappointed with that decision. And so I think that that kind of played into the role of me questioning and looking into leadership. Yeah. And it's interesting because I've heard this with a lot of career fields and now, and we'll get into this, I'm currently going through SOS and e-learning, so distance learning. Yeah. You know, you hear this all over the Air Force, you know, it's situations like that that are kind of the personal 
choice or personal brand. Yeah. And, you know, you just question that. And I hated feeling that way. Yeah. Because whenever you're doing the job, it's the best thing ever. It's the stuff outside of the job that really just drains you and kind of sucks the life out of you. And that's kind of where I was thinking, am I going back to a career field like that? Yeah. You know, I, yeah. So that's really the biggest thing for me that said, hey, you might want to look in the reserves and having a little bit more control of where you're going, what you're going to be doing in that type of process. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Colin and I talk about how it's all about trust. It is all about trust. And when you violate either the connection, right, you don't have that interpersonal connection and that's not working. Trust isn't going to be there. And if there's any reason to doubt character, you know, and I can kind of see how in that story, it just started to put some cracks in that facade for you just enough just enough. Exactly. And one thing, and I didn't mention this earlier, and once again, I probably should mention these things, but that particular flight commander, my friend who I switched with, he was the number one graduate out of our security forces tech school. And he also was the Todd Helton award winner, which is a leadership award. And so I hold him in very high regards leadership wise. And I, I mentioned that, but you know, I say that just to give a little bit of qualification for where his head would have been. You don't go through a six month course and graduate number one, and you receive a leadership award because you fake your way through it. Yeah. Just a genuine guy. And this decision in no way would have compromised his leading ability, uh, especially with a flight as big as he had. Yeah. No, that's good. We're all going to get different experiences. You know, I'm sure we talked about this with our cadets. You want to doubt or have a question about the impact you as an individual can have? It can be pretty huge. You know, individual decisions, individual experiences can have massive impacts on people. And and that is both the blessing and curse of being a leader in the United States Air Force. I think it's a privilege and a challenge. And if you're not a little bit nervous, you know, every time you walk into a meeting and you've got people and you've got to make decisions, if you're not even just, you know, thinking about it a little bit, you're probably in the wrong business because, you know, careers hinge on this kind of stuff. It's so good to talk to you, man. I miss you so much. <laughs> it's, it's uh, I, so love good. It. So I love it. I love it. I'm right there with you. Yeah. All right. So let's talk Big Blue, Big Blue Air Force. Yeah. What is the AFSC? What is the vision? What's the history in the background? Why does security forces exist? So going into, you know, 31 Papa is the AFSC, you know, code whenever you're looking at it in reference to the Air Force. And initially we started at, you know, Defensor Fortis, you know, Defender of the Fort. And then you see, you know, on the beret, you have the Falcon and there's two runways. And, and essentially from the beginning of time, you know, going all the way back to security police era is that, you know, it was base defense was our thing so that we could ensure that the mission continued forward. And is that, are we flying? Are we going outside the wire during Vietnam missions? Is it helicopters or jets? It, it doesn't matter what it is. We have to establish, you know, that we are going to protect the base and we're going to ensure that the mission gets done. And so the biggest overview is base defense. Okay. And then within that, and that's where you have your gate guards. Every single day you drive into work, they salute you and, you know, you salute them back and there's that gesture, there's that interaction. And, you know, you kind of think, okay, yeah, that's what they're doing there. But You know, that's the first line of deterrence as we know it within the Air Force. You know, it's not just high walls, it's people to people interaction so that you know, okay, there is a person behind this uniform and they're doing the job. They're making the mission happen. They're ensuring that our planes are protected downrange. They're ensuring that our population on base is protected. And that doesn't only include, you know, us who are military members, but also you have on-base housing, you have civilians, you have, you know, all different types of people that are coming to that base for different things. And so ultimately that is the big mission. And so within that, you know, we have some different paths you can take, especially for our enlisted counterparts is that you can, we call it their shreds. Okay. So you can go and you can be a cattle member. So combat arms. Those are the folks wearing the red hats that teach you firearms hats, instruction, that's right? Exactly, that's yeah. right. Okay. They're going to teach you firearms. They're going to ensure that the range is safe. They're going to teach you all those basic skills there. Okay. Then you can also go to be a canine handler. That's another shred that you could go through. And the interesting thing about their career field is that they're not only working at the base. A lot of them, they are kind of uh, used in different capacities. If the president or someone of that nature is going to come through, the Secret Service will task them because they need to use that canine for the canine's capabilities. And whether that's an explosive detection dog, whether that's a narcotic detection dog, every dog in the military is dual purpose. Okay. 
So it's going to be a bite and an explosive or a bite and narcotics. Okay. They can't be narcotics and explosive. There's some cross-pollination that causes issues there. Got it. Okay. But then we're actually, you know, another kind of general overview that is coming is that we are moving towards a federal certification for uh, law enforcement on bases. Okay. And I think that it's an old concept. They're kind of revitalizing, mm -hmm. but it's also going to kind of bring back understanding that we're not just defending the base. You know, we're also making sure that the things that go on the base are legal and ethical and moral. And that's where you kind of can intertwine investigations. We do have an investigations branch within security forces who works hand in hand with OSI. Okay. I know that you've had an OSI special agent on here, listen to that podcast. And so there's a lot at that point starts intertwining. So I kind of give that overview just to say, you know, we have a main mission, but that can change base to base. But kind of going back to the roots is we're going to defend the base. Got it. Okay. And um, how big is the officer AFSE, like how many security forces officers are there? I know that there are a lot of airmen. Almost every installation I've ever been at, security forces is usually one of the biggest squadrons. Yeah, it's, it's generally security forces and maintenance. Yeah. I don't have the number, but there's not enough, I can tell you that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can always use more people. Yeah. Okay. You know, you mentioned something. You mentioned the beret. What's kind of the background and history of that? Because I know that there are a few FSCs that wear them, they tend to be more run and gun, shoot them in the face type people, you know, so pararescue, combat controllers. I know some of the, the special weather people have them. And then there's you guys. And so like, where's that come from? It doesn't kind of fit in with the rest, you know, the flight caps and, and flight suits and stuff. So where does that kind of come from? Yeah. You know, if I'm having this conversation with a flight chief, it's only to get a wicked tan line that looks really dumb. But uh, <laughs> but that's kind of that's kind of an inner AFSC joke okay. that we talk about. You know, you get this sideways yeah. tan going along your forehead. No, if I recall correctly, it's so that you could identify. Hey, you know, this is security forces or security police, and basically, it's so that no matter if they're in the BX, in the commissary, around base housing. They're readily identifiable. Okay. And because, you know, if we're all wearing the same uniform, we all look the same. So what shows someone Got it. that, okay, oh, there's someone that I know, you know, it's not just, oh, that's multicam. What rank is that? I can't really yeah, tell. Yeah, is that yeah. brown okay. or is that? Yeah. Gotcha. Right. So that's really where it came from. So that you're identifying this individual as a law enforcement authority. Got it. Okay. That makes a whole lot of sense. I also know, at least on ABUs, um, it's a little harder to see on the multicams, but you guys also have like a badge that you wear, right? You're given a badge that kind of indicates that you're also law enforcement. Is that fair? So on the ABUs we did on the multicams, we're not doing that right now. Okay. What they're doing, they are allowing one on the shoulder, a shoulder patch. You'll see SF. Yeah. Like at Barksdale right now, it's SF with a black border around it. Okay. I think that internally they're trying to work that issue out because like you said, you know, whenever you had on ABUs, it's very identifiable. Is that badge? You know, you see, okay, this is a badge. Yeah. But on multicams, it kind of seems like they're trying to figure out their way right now because originally you could also wear a badge underneath that SF and they change that to, hey, this needs to be the MAGCOM. Okay. And yeah. They're working so, through that then. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Also, the beret and badge are only worn when you are fulfilling that role. Cause I remember at OTS, you were not wearing those things. You had another badge that indicated, you know, what was that badge? Because I'm just trying to, you know, figure all this stuff out, right? You had another one on. Whenever we're using the term badge, what we're talking about is an identifier that you are working in a law enforcement capacity. Okay. And that was generally below the breast pocket. Okay. But then the badge that was above the name tapes, mm -hmm. that just shows that your current AFSC is security forces. Okay. But in the role at OTS, I was not acting in a security forces capacity. So the badge on my ABUs had to come off since yeah. I was operating as an 81 Tango. Got it. Yeah. Because again, you don't want some person walking through the BX to, you know, try to enforce the law if they're not authorized to do that because that's what those things signify, right? Exactly. Those things signify an authority. That's correct. That's correct. And that's a really different thing. We as commissioned officers have authority just by the nature of our commission. And Colin and I have talked about that before, but 
you members of the security forces also have a different authority that is given to you that is then it's not embodied or imbued in those things, but they're manifest in those things. And so that's one of those reasons why we've got those symbols to demonstrate that authority. Exactly. You're exactly right. Nice. Awesome. Something you mentioned, and, and I want to come back to, you said they're working on a sort of federal certification. When you went through technical training, did you go through any like federal law enforcement training so that you know, if you were to work with, I don't know, the FBI or the U.S. Marshals or some other federal organization that you had some sort of equivalent certification, or is that something that we're now working toward? No. So it's not like OSI, you know, all OSI special agents, they go through FLETC, which is Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. The closest thing that we do is that we can have a LEOSA credential, which is LEOSA came from the Law Enforcement Officer Safety Act. And it basically identifies you as a law enforcement officer. And what it does is it enables you to conceal and carry in all 50 states because they are identifying you as a certified law enforcement officer. But other than that, there is no you know federal guideline or federal training course that you go through whenever you're in your original tech school. Got it. Okay. No, that's helpful. Also, you mentioned OSI and that security forces has some investigation capability. We've had an OSI special agent on. Help us understand kind of those different roles, those different lanes between those two. I think the audience might have a grasp on it, but I think it might be helpful to kind of, you know, really line it out. Sure. So I'm going to start with the narrow first. And the narrow would be investigations within security forces is going to be primarily all security forces issues all issues that are related to security forces. So that can be at the squadron level, or that can be at the base level that involves security forces, whether that's, you know, a domestic violence call that requires follow-up action. We might send an investigator instead of a patrolman. An investigator is going to be in plain clothes. They might, you know, allow them to come into the office and just have a conversation so that there's not any, you know, anything that could intimidate them or scare them or have them worried about anything. Whereas whenever you get into OSI, OSI is a federally certified officer and they're federally recognized. So OSI's jurisdiction is much more encompassing. So OSI, once security forces, you know, goes hands off, OSI could come in. So let's say that there was an off-base incident involving an airman. That airman was with the intelligence squadron or the CE squadron or whatever it is. OSI has that federal jurisdiction to enforce the law because there is a United States Air Force member involved in whatever maybe illicit or illegal activities going okay. on, whereas security forces does not have that reach. That's not their jurisdiction at Got that it. point. Okay. So you folks then are the fence, maybe, you know, some designated distance related to the fence, right? Because you can't wait until they come inside to take action, right? If you've got an, you know, adversary you need to take care of, there's got to be some distance there that you're allowed to engage. And then everything happening on the inside, generally, is that kind of a fair designation of, you know, who's kind of got the lead? And then depending on the nature of it, if investigations have to go further, you may have to hand off. And that's probably going to be all coordinated. You guys coordinate quite a bit on this kind of thing or? Yeah, all the time. And that's one thing that I think is a bigger lesson. It's a bigger leadership lesson. Knowing your skill set and knowing your mission is so important because if you don't stay in your lane, you will get ran over. And, and it's not, <laughs> it's not fun. You know, you go to one of these big meetings, you know, just using the OTS example. I remember we go into, you know, our flight commander weekly flight commander meeting and someone who's might be experienced or might not, they start talking about something, but it's not their show to run. Maybe they used to ran it. And then, you know, the boss steps in and says, Hey, who's running this? Like, yeah. are you running this? Okay. Then let's let them, you know, go with it. And, yeah. you know, I think as officers, we always want to do a good job, but we somehow think that doing more equals a good job when that's not always the case. Yeah. Just doing what you're asked to do is doing a good job and doing it well to the best of your abilities. So, you know, it's just a constant reminder for me is like, Hey, you know, your mission, you know, your capabilities, you know, your skill sets stay within those things. And then if it's outside of that, let's see what we need to do and who can help us take care of that at that point. Yeah, no, totally. Awesome. So let's imagine we've got, you know, maybe a ROTC cadet out there, somebody at USAFA trying to figure out what they want to be when they grow up. Like you or I have that figured out. I act like we know something, right? We're, <laughs> we're still trying to figure out what we want to do. So if you were to kind of give them, you know, a little bit of what does a day in the life look like? for a security forces officer. I know they're going to be vastly different, right? If you're going to be stationed at Bellows Beach 
in Oahu, Hawaii, you know, life is probably pretty cush compared to Malms from Air Force Base, Global Strike Command. But what are like some big themes that maybe you could give, you know, quality of life type stuff to help people kind of understand what the job is like? The biggest thing that you're going to see within security forces, just like any other major career field, is that from day one to the day you separate or retire, you will be leading in some type of capacity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the emphasis is that you will be making decisions. You will have to take responsibility. You will have to have ownership in what's going on. And so I know that that doesn't answer the question for a day in a life, but there is a broader theme there that there's a lot of eyes on you at all times. And so whether you're a butter bar or a first lieutenant or an 06, People are looking for your decisions to not only, you know, baseline be made with common sense in mind, but also to enhance the quality of life for those who are affected by the decisions that you make. So on the broadest scale, it's going to demand a call for action that is rooted in leadership. And I know that that's a very broad term. There's some, you know, just broad general things, but like you said, it mounts from day to day. If I'm in the missile field, I can control where I go. Do I want to go to LF Alpha or Bravo or Charlie or wherever? Or do I want to do a training exercise instead? Whereas, you know, here at Barksdale, I don't have the reach to go out to those different places. So yeah. like you said, it can be very different. But once again, there is a decision making process behind that. Yeah. So it is a tricky question to ask, but I think that before, if I was on the fence about, do I want to do security forces? I would ask yourself, do you want to be heavily involved in leadership and leadership decisions? And which will lead to your development and those, you know, under you, uh, then that's a great question to ask yourself if you're in that, in that position. Yeah. And sure. Maintenance will do that. You know, I think about other career fields, you know, CE is another pretty big one mm -hmm. where you can see that. But whereas in contrast, that as a pilot, you might not have a subordinate until you're 10 years in, yeah, 12 years in, 15 years in. So, yeah, I'm kind of stuck on that question, to be honest with you, because I feel that it's such a hard one to answer. There's no there's no day in the life. Yeah, it's always going to be different, but mm -hmm. there's always going to be decisions to be made. Yeah, I think that's a really good thing to bring out is. Yes, there is technical things you need to understand. You need to be a technician at some level, right? You have to know what you're doing. But man, you are leading at a high level and a lot of people from day one until the day you're done. I think that's a really good way of saying that's what your life's going to be like. Whereas, like you said, with other AFSCs, especially in our service, they may be much more technically or technician focused than leading focused. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So... Before we get into kind of the more philosophical things, you know, about, you know, handing a ton of guns to people who aren't even legally allowed to buy them in the United <laughs> States age wise, do you have like a crazy story that you could share or, you know, just one of those things that you could not have imagined that this is where you'd be doing this thing at this time, you know, whether that it's a minus 20 at Malmstrom and the snow's going and you got to go, you know, teach somebody how to stay dry or something crazy. I don't know. You got to have some great stories. Yeah. Well, we're talking about leadership here, so I'll stick with kind of that theme. Yeah. There have been times, and I remember whenever I was at Malmstrom, I was a second lieutenant. We had this thing called the Global Strike Command Challenge. Okay. And it's where all the Global Strike Commands, their bases, they put together different teams and security forces, maintenance, helicopter operations, et cetera. And basically, they're competing, quote unquote, within these other bases to see who has the best squadrons. And is it security forces? And then they can make up and you can win what's called the Blanchard Trophy if you're the overall best. So we went through a, a tryout and I was one of the officers selected to go through this. And so I was rotted from duty. So relieved of duty. And I, I've heard you can't use that term in the Air Force anymore. I don't know if that's true or not. Yeah, I, I haven't heard hilarious it. If okay. You can't say rotted. <laughs> but uh, so relieved of duty is what it stands for. So okay. Every single day, we would wake up and we would PT, some type of PT together as a team. Yep. We'd go eat breakfast together as a team. We'd go, you know, break out, hey, go home for an hour, shower, change, get ready for the day. We would meet up. And then after that, it was all security forces related training. And we had a big training plan for six weeks. Mm -hmm. And from, you know, 530 in the morning until, you know, 430 or five at night, 
it was just training with everyone there. There was only 10 of us. And I was just thinking to myself, like, I'm getting paid to shoot guns. I remember going out to the range and we had so many rounds for 203, which is a grenade launcher, yeah. that we were having competitions of who could hit what vehicle the furthest. And they had to like, you know, without aiming properly and stuff like that. Yeah, you just, oh man. And, and so we're just, you know, just things like that. But I think the best experience about that was before we started, there was two of us, we were two officers mm -hmm. and we sat down with the whole team and we said, hey guys, we're in this competition to win the competition, not to be some lieutenant so-and-so. So from here on forward, I don't need you to call me by my rank. I don't need to be advised as sir. I don't need any of that. I want you to call me by my name. I want you to make corrections as you would anyone else because I'm going to do the same for you because we need to come together as a team in order to win this competition. Mm -hmm. It was just so relieving and you just saw the camaraderie and the cohesiveness and the chemistry just really just gel together and you're getting paid to do all that type of training, you know, CQB, sim rounds, shooting guns, rucking, you know, all these different things that you're like, man, I wish I could get paid to do that. Well, we got paid to do that. And yeah. then we got TDY out to Guernsey, Wyoming for a week mm -hmm. to compete with that. And so, you know, that's one of those things where for others from the outside, they might think, oh, well, I mean, you know, I've ridden in helicopters and yes, we've, I've ridden helicopters too and done that stuff, but just the cohesiveness of going from, oh, that's Lieutenant Jopling to an A1C saying, Johnny, cover that door right there, you yeah. know, and without hesitation. Like I'm going to have no problems with this A1C telling me what to do yeah. because we're so focused going back to, Hey, know your job, do your job. Let's accomplish the mission together. Yeah. That's a pretty special thing, right? It's only happened a few times in my life. And when you are in a group where everybody's firing on all cylinders, doing their roles, it's a special thing. Yeah. That's outstanding stuff. Awesome. All right. So let's kind of transition to, you know, kind of the end part here where we talk about you know, some of these real leadership challenges. And you've given us some really good tidbits for sure on some things. And, you know, reps matter when it comes to leadership. It absolutely matters. And I think you guys get, you know, in the security forces career field, I feel like you get a lot of reps. You're given a lot of airmen. You give them weapons. And it's a very visible mission, Right. Absolutely. Some retired 06 is going to drive in the gate and see some airmen's got a little bit of not quite shaved right here and you're going to get a phone call. <laughs> right. I mean, 100 percent, 100 percent. I know. Yeah. So and or you don't salute the retired colonel's wife who was never even in, but she's a dependent and wants to be saluted because he was an 06 or. Yep, yeah. I've been I'm, down that I, road, yeah, too. I'm sure. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, that seems like a real refiner's fire. You know, so what are some of those big leadership lessons that meant a lot to you that you learned that are pretty unique to your experience because you were just thrust in at a high level early on? You know, the first thing that comes to mind is, and you can apply this to any part of your life, but how you do anything is how you do everything. How you decide to make your bed, how you decide to fold your clothes you know, whatever you're going to do, that's how you're going to do it every time after that. And you're going to continue to build those habits. And that leads into the second part of being strong, being fast, being fill in the blank for these kind of almost macho words that we use. They can't replace consistency. Yeah. The person who shows up and just puts in the time and the effort with a great attitude, like that person is the one who comes out on top because they're constantly seeking not only to make themselves better as a person, as a leader, as a fill in the blank, but they also want to make everybody around them better. And so they become self-aware in that process. And I've really been fortunate to serve with people like that throughout, you know, from being a second lieutenant, a first lieutenant, and now a captain, and really been put in some of those positions to really grow and mature in some of those areas that man, they just mean a lot. And so, you know, just having that attitude that, you know, there's no such thing as having a bad day. It's only what you make it. You know, I've been thinking about this a lot lately and that there's no such thing as a bad experience. There's only such things as experience. Yeah. Who says that it's bad? You know, you say it's bad. And earlier I said it, you know, like I said, oh, I was frustrated with Montana. I look back on that. And I was like, man, I learned a lot about myself during that time in Montana. I really grew in this area and that area. Yeah. 
And I look back and at the time, I'm like, this is such a bad experience. But now on the other side of it, I'm like, I needed that experience. Yeah. Because it wasn't a bad experience. It was just another experience. So I could say, yep, been there, done that. And so, you know, kind of with that, with that theme, I would say there are no such thing as bad days. There's just days and you can make them what you are. They can be a, a day full of learning, a day full of growing or a day full of complaining, but it's all up to you. The amount of work is the same. Yeah. But that's only your decision to make. Yeah. No, that's solid. I remember when we interviewed Major Zane Stedman for the intelligence officer, he was an assignments officer for part of his time. And he said, you know what? People will be miserable wherever they want to be miserable. Yes. You know, they'll be in tears in Hawaii. They'll be jumping for joy at Minot. And so that really gets to your point. And I love that. You know, there's a spectrum of control, right? There's circumstances, which who our parents are. We can't choose who our parents are. We can't choose what year we were born, the state of the economy. Those are our circumstances. And then we have chances. Sometimes you can affect those, right? But not always, right? You couldn't pick your first assignment. That's how it happened. Sometimes you can try to make your own luck, you know, kind of take things into your own hands and put yourself in a situation where those pitches might come your way. But the last category are choices. Absolutely. Those things you own. And so I love how you put that, you know, it's not a bad day. It's just a day. It's what you make with it. I love it. That's right. Yeah. And I've heard it said like this, and it's probably a little bit more eloquent, but this is not my quote. It's, we can either make ourselves miserable or make ourselves strong. The amount of work is the same. Yeah. No, I love it. Good stuff, man. That's awesome. Johnny, this has been so good. I want to keep talking for like ever and ever, but I have to respect our audience and their time and your time too. I am so grateful you're able to join us today. Before we wrap up with our famous last question, is there anything else that you want to cover that you know, you'd know you love to share with our audience and those who might be thinking about this career field or thinking about the Air Force or you know military life in general? No, I think, and I just actually put it up on social media the other day. It's a quote by Nick Saban in... Uh, Yes, Nick Saban was at LSU, but now he's at Alabama. But I still respect him because the leader he is. <laughs> but he said, if you want to make everyone happy, don't be a leader. Go sell ice cream. Yeah. So, you know, no matter where you're at in your journey, if you're in ROTC, if you're at the academy or you're a captain major or even above that listening to this is that you can't please everybody. But what you can do is you can control your effort. You can control your attitude. And all that is internal, going back to what we originally, what we just talked about, you know? And so yeah, trying to control the controllables. And I struggle with this, honestly. It's one of the things that I constantly have to remind myself that, you know, you're in the driver's seat and you have the wheel and you have control of the gas pedal. No one else does. Mm -hmm. And those are the only things you can control. You can't control which direction traffic is traveling, how fast it's going or how slow it's going. Yep. But with that said, control what you can control. Yeah. And don't be afraid to mess up in that process because once again, you're not selling ice cream. Yeah. Not everyone's going to be happy, but control what you can control in that process. Love it. All right, Johnny, you knew this question was coming. What is an officer? You know, I was thinking about this and I wrote some things down and I don't think that you can put one definition. And so I'm just going to read just a few bullets that I wrote down for yeah. it. Yeah. What does it mean to be an officer? Taking responsibility, owning decisions leading from the front, giving to those below you, around you, and above you. And that's kind of just a summary. It's the culmination. There's been books written on leadership and love, but no one can really define them exceptionally well, but you know it when you see it. Yep. So, you know, I guess the last thing that I would say, and we'll leave it at this to respect, you know, like you said, you know, our audience's time and your time as well. But, you know, in that process, of making yourself, you know, this leader, you're going to make the team better. You're going to make everyone else better around you because of the effort that you're putting in. And so I would just encourage, you know, our listeners, you read, I'm encouraging myself by just talking about this, you know, kind of going back through this is that by doing those things, we're not only bettering ourselves and those around us, but, you know, every single interaction that we have is going to be better because of that. Awesome. Johnny, super pleasure. It was always good to talk to you. We don't talk enough. I'll own that. It's uh, super good to catch up and really, really drop some knowledge bombs for us today. Great review of the career field. And I definitely think we left our audience with something to go for. So really appreciate you joining us today, man. Hey, thanks a bunch, Reed. Like I said at the beginning, I really enjoyed listening to Johnny, what he had to say. And I think where I want to go first 
is something that we've talked about on a number of different occasions, but I don't know that we've really gotten into it in great detail. Maybe a little bit with the chief from the home center when we got his perspective on being a senior NCO and the relationship with an officer. But so you and Johnny in the interview talked about the importance of finding a good senior NCO. And this is one of those pieces of advice that every new lieutenant, every CGO, every cadet is going to hear at some point. Yep, absolutely. You know, they say, hey, as a new officer, what is one of those things that I can do to set myself up for success? And invariably, this is the thing that you're going to hear. Find a good senior NCO. Tat yourself at the hip. Learn what they know. Just download all of their information. Get some advice from them. That's going to you know, steer you in the right direction. And I want to address that head on. What is a good senior NCO? How do you know they are a good senior NCO? And then how do you begin having that relationship with them? Yeah. So I want to start there. Get your thoughts. Let's have a discussion about this. Yeah. So first, 100% agree. This is something we've all heard and we've all said, right? Colin, you and I, as instructors to new lieutenants, we said, go find one. So yeah, totally critical. The first thing I think of when trying to identify a good senior NCO is that this is someone that people, including other officers, are listening to. Mm -hmm. And not because they're loud, not because they're in a position of authority necessarily, you know, not just because they're the op soup or the superintendent, and those are usually good people to look to, but the point is, when they are talking, other people are listening. Yeah, That's a big thing for me to say, hey, they've done something, or they have experience, or they've in some way proved themselves worthy of being listened to. For me, that's a big, hey, this is how you can identify them. And then to your second question, how do you start the relationship? You ask a question, and you listen. When you listen, it demonstrates a humility, it demonstrates a willingness to learn. And that is what a senior NCO wants to do. That is part of their charge. In the little brown book, it says a senior NCO is to mentor company grade officers. So if you as a CGO are listening, that is how it starts. And I think that's my advice on how to identify them and how to get that relationship started. Yeah, I think it's really good. I think you're setting us in the right direction, but I want to parse this out a little bit more. So what is the context where you as an officer are going to be able to listen to a senior NCO and see other people listening to them? Is this in a staff meeting? And so that the senior NCOs that are there are all flight chiefs or superintendents of sections or something like that. Are those the people that we're talking about? Are we talking about in a social event? You can see who is the senior NCO with a crowd around them that are just, you know, hanging on every word that that person is saying. Is it that you're making the rounds around the squadron and you happen upon a section meeting, flight meeting, or just an informal mentorship moment on the flight line under the wing of an aircraft? You know, do you see what I'm saying? Like, how does this actually happen? Where do you see these things happen? I think it's all of those. And... And I think that's an important distinction. I don't think this is a binary, I am going to go to this thing, and I will therefore find my senior NCO mentor. I think you need to have an attitude, a perspective, a way of being of, I need to learn. And so it's all of those. And I tend to lean more towards an accumulation of small things over time versus mm -hmm. I go to a social event there's one person that is clearly the life of the party. That may not be exactly who you want. It might be that more quiet expert power that that senior NCO has, that when they are walking by and they see something being done, that they have an attitude of, hey, I like what you're doing there, but maybe it can be a little bit better if you do it this way. Or, you know, those, for me, it's all the small things. And, and that's what I tend to do is, is it's an accumulation. So it takes a little bit of time. Yeah, it's more a perspective and a way of being. I'm looking for someone who can give me that instead of a checklist. And you know me, Colin, I love my checklists, yeah. but, <laughs> but this is not a checklist thing. This is one of those checklist items that never quite gets filled in because you're always, always looking for it. Yeah, and I like that you just took everything that I suggested and you said, 
Yes. Because it shows what it takes for you to find someone who is that good senior in CEO. It's not just going to happen out of the blue. It's not usually a serendipitous thing, but it requires your deliberate action and involvement in the squadron. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's not going to happen if you're sitting behind your computer. For sure. Wondering, when is the senior NCO going to come and mentor me? Get out of the chair. You want to know why? Because the good senior NCO is also not behind a computer. Yeah. Yeah. Unbutt the seat and go see some people. <laughs> like, go do this. Yeah, totally agree. So another thing that I wanted to talk about here about this is like, you say that you can recognize a good senior NCO by the fact that they have a presence, people are listening to them, they have a knowledge and experience that enables the mission. But I wonder, are there additional things that help you to distinguish them from everybody else? Like, does it matter what rank they are? You know, we say senior and CO, but there are three different ranks there that are also all very different. The master sergeant from the senior master sergeant from the chief, all very different responsibilities and numbers of them, right? Yeah, yeah. But also like, who are they outside of the squadron? Like, are there milestones that different things that they do or are involved with that are going to signal to you, hey, this is the kind of person that you should spend your time with? that you should be listening to, trying to mold yourself based off of their advice. For example, their involvement outside of the squadron. Are they involved in the top three for the base, for the wing? Are they someone who is known in other areas of the base? Like, you know, if you're in the mission support group, are they known over on the operational side? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I get what you're saying. And I think we could, you know, recommend that our audience go listen to some of our tips on how to find a good mentor from previous episodes, because I think the same things apply. Yeah. If I'm a young single lieutenant who's looking to deploy, you know, and really get out there and the senior NCOs that I'm looking to advice from are more of the homebodies, maybe they haven't deployed, wife and kids type, that advice might be different. And so just in the same way that you kind of need to find somebody who is going to get you where you want to be or they have something you want, you kind of have to look at your NCOs and senior NCOs as well. When it comes to rank, I do think they need to have a few reps on them. I think they need to have been around the sun a few times because, Colin, you know, our enlisted counterparts are more down and in. Yeah. And our officers are more up and out. And those senior NCOs are those who are best able to know where the difference is, where the line is, and help you understand when and how to be down and in, but also where they need you to be looking up and out. Mm -hmm. I think some of our more junior airmen don't have that. Right. I'm not saying you can't find an amazing technical sergeant who can help you with that. You can, right? Just, I think they need to have a few more reps than say a senior airman. You know, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. And I like that how you put that, that you need a, a senior NCO who has that understanding of the difference between looking down and in versus up and out, because you as the officer need to, from the very beginning, have that up and out sort of vision. Yes, become that technical expert, understand your AFSC, your responsibility, your squadron, your mission, but you need to start looking from the very beginning how you fit not just in the squadron, but how the squadron fits into the group and the wing and the base and then the bigger Air Force. And if you have a senior NCO or an NCO who only understands the down and in aspect of it, maybe they are just the best linguist or the best master electrician, anything like that. They are just the super SME at their craft. They're not really going to be able to help you as much as the senior NCO who better understands the up and out sort of perspective. Yep. In helping you to become the officer you need to be. Exactly. Yeah. No, I totally agree. And I think that's, those are kind of the big things that I would look for, you know, when I'm trying to find that it's that senior NCO to help me grow. All right. So thanks for helping me understand that. I feel like we've done a good job there of helping the audience understand when they hear, find a good senior NCO, there are some actionable steps, things that they should be looking for in order to achieve that. Yeah. And Johnny mentioned that he didn't necessarily get that. He found an NCO attached himself. And then only later did he realize, oh, maybe this wasn't exactly what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to know because again, we're all new at this, right? As a brand new second lieutenant, 
like, oh, okay, well, I've found senior NCOs who advise me exactly zero times, you know, <laughs> unless you're a prior. So it's one of those things that not everybody has. And I'm glad Johnny gave us an opportunity to kind of address that. What are some other things from the interview you wanted to chat about? So I had one other thing that has been noodling around in my brain. So Johnny talks about the security forces construct as a whole, not just the officers, but you know the officers, the enlisted, the whole structure exists in order for them to provide law enforcement and base defense. And I thought it was so fascinating, his description of the beret and the badge, how those are worn so that security forces, airmen, officer enlisted are readily identifiable as law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when stuff hits the fan, bolts are flying, everything's going crazy. You need to have that ability to point them out immediately. Yeah. And so that beret and that badge then become a physical symbol of an authority that they have that is separate and distinct from the authority of the commission. But then I got to thinking about it and I had to ask myself, is it though, like, is the law enforcement officer's authority really that different from the commission that we receive as officers? Because when you think about it, what do we all swear to support and defend the Constitution of the United States, which is the law? Mm -hmm. It's the supreme law of the land. And so I know that they are separate and distinct. Like in my heart, I know that. In my mind, I know that. But because we're all protecting and defending the same thing, where is the line there? Yeah, like you said, the ultimate source is the same. The ultimate source is the same. And I think it's about the authority that you are given specifically to operate, right? I have authority to do my job. You have authority, Colin, to do your job. And a security forces airman, officer or enlisted, has authority to do their job. And yet the source of that authority is the same. It's just who gets which piece of that pie. There's only one pie, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same pie. I'm partial to pumpkin, but, you know, that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> the point is, everybody has a different lane, a different piece of that, and they execute it differently. But yeah, I think the ultimate source is the same. And I think that's important to recognize is that is where we get our authority and our power. It just manifests in different ways. Well, let me go a little bit further on and explain why I'm thinking about this. Like, are these you know, slices of the pie actually that different? For example, I know that a commander has the ability to detain, to imprison, to punish, you know, dock pay, you know, require that certain duties be performed in response to poor behavior that go against, you know, in response to infractions of the UCMJ, right? Mm -hmm. Well, is that they're usurping the, the authority of the security forces, or is it that there is a very specific difference between the things that the security forces airmen are able to enforce versus what the commander can? And maybe a part of this is just, I've never been a commander. I don't know. I've never been to a squadron commander's course to see exactly what I can and cannot do for NJP and those kinds of things. But do you see why I'm yeah. Yeah, no, wondering? Yeah, yeah, no, I do. And in a preview of a future episode, my thought is call JA. <laughs> That's the first thing I'm thinking. Uh, but the next thing I'm thinking is there's entire books on this, The Commander and the Law. And yeah. you see them all the time. And, and again, I think the source of the power is the same, but there are lines. I can't imagine that it's allowed for a commander to break down your door and put handcuffs on you. That seems like a line. I'm just going to throw that out there. Yeah. I've been pretty confident that security forces airmen, if you are living on base and you're breaking the law and they need to, pretty sure they can go in and get you. You know, I'm pretty confident because I've seen it happen. So <laughs> that's what I'm getting at. Like there are lines. I don't know where they are, but that's where your JAG is going to be able to advise you mm -hmm. on what those are. But I do think, and this is something we've talked about personally, you know, calling you and I offline. I don't know that as a commissioned officer in my sessions training, I got enough training to understand the responsibilities that I would have in that realm. Yeah. And we've talked about this in previous episodes. It was not too long after we were commissioned that we were investigating officers. Yeah. Like, wait, I have to like read someone their Miranda rights. I have a little card in my wallet so that at any time I need to read someone their rights to take a statement that I can do that 
Like I was not ready for that. Mm -hmm. And I do think that there is a lot of overlap and Colin, this is stuff you and I got to learn more about. Yeah. I feel wholly unqualified. I really appreciate Johnny in sharing his perspective on it, but it's highlighting to me how much I still don't know and how much I need to know in order to effectively serve as an officer, but also to support what's going on elsewhere, such as the security forces airmen and what they need to do. Yeah. Which leads me to the thing I wanted to talk about. I've got two. The first of those is, and I mentioned this in the interview, just the absurdity <laughs> of what we're asking of these officers and young airmen. Hi, you're 21. You just graduated college. You've been to training for six months. I'm going to give you a squad of 50 or so people, some up armored Humvees, some ammo carriers, some grenade launchers and firearms. Oh, by the way, none of which you're allowed to buy because you're too young. <laughs> and I'm going to put you out in the middle of nowhere guarding intercontinental nuclear equipped intercontinental ballistic missiles. It's all going to be fine. What could possibly what go could wrong? What could possibly go wrong, right? <laughs> so, and Colin, before we started, you and I were talking about this. This is, it's not just absurd, it's awesome. It's incredible. And it's not just security forces. Yeah. We do this all the time with airmen from all walks of life. We bring them in, we send them through in a sessions or a basic experience. We shape them into an airman. We send them to school for a little bit. And then we freaking run the air force. And it's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. We haven't burned this place to the ground yet. I knew that on paper, right? I know that there are airmen everywhere guarding nukes you know, guarding bases. Like, I know that they're a very visible career field, but it just, it really sunk in as he's talking about it, you know, going out to the missile fields with his team. And so I love that he brought that. And I hope our audience can see this image in your mind. I want you to imagine yourself, no matter what your station is, six months from now, leading 50 people to go guard ICBMs. And it's going to be fine because we got this, you know, like, come yeah. on, how cool is this? I mean, things do go wrong. Yes. Yes, they do. The Air Force is not perfect. But like you said, the fact that we haven't burned this to the ground yet, that we don't have you know, nuclear missiles constantly flying off and, you know, airplanes going to places that they shouldn't and the nation's secrets, you know, being constantly, you know, shared out. I mean, those things do happen. Yeah. Maybe not the nuclear weapons flying off in any direction, but, you know, things do go wrong. But the frequency at which they go wrong pales in comparison to how often we get it right. Yes. Enough so that when any of those bad things happen, everyone's shocked. Yeah. Right? It makes front page news across the globe. And it's just, yeah, super very blue go Air Force moment for me with Johnny. <laughs> He's just so calm, cool, and collected. He's like, yep. Yeah, just like this <laughs> is what we do. So, yeah, I love that. And I know we talked about it in, in the interview, but gosh, it just hit me in. Very proud to be an airman moment for me. The next thing, and this is, it was so fun to talk to Johnny. And I wish you could have been there, Colin, you know, those late nights grading papers in Cube City. Oh, I've been there. Yeah, I know. But he was one of my sanities. He was one of those people who could just, I needed that man. Thank you. We're going to be okay together. You know, he was just, yeah. <laughs> he was such a stalwart, you know, just an awesome wingman. And like I said, we stay in touch to this day, but something that you may have picked up in the interview. And I think our audience may have as well is he is probably one of the best officers I have ever known who is able to very, very delicately balance this idea of being liked and giving necessary negative feedback. Mm -hmm. He kind of doesn't care if you like him in a way. And I'm trying to, it's so hard to describe. I mean, I've been trying to think about this forever. I think the quote that he gives at the end from Nick Saban about, if you want to be liked by everybody, sell ice cream, don't be a leader. Mm -hmm. He lives that completely. And he had no problem telling his cadets when they screwed up. Zero. I mean, that was dumb. You know, I mean, he would not pull punches he would let them know, and he was not liked by his flight. He was beloved by his flights, all of them. They would do anything for him. Yeah. And 
I think that's something I see a lot of young officers, especially working too hard to be everyone's friend. And I'm not saying be a jerk. You know, we've said that before, right? You need to be a, a decent person. Yeah. Be kind. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But also don't make that your goal. Don't make it the goal for everyone to like you. Yeah. Because that's not what our airmen need. Right. They need, as you've described in previous episodes, they need that father figure or mother figure. They need someone to say that was not good. Mm -hmm. And he better than almost anyone I've ever met can connect with his people deeply and profoundly yet tell them when they screw up. And I've seen it. I've seen him give feedback to his students in ways that I was like, Ooh, that was harsh, but they're just eating it up. They're just eating it up. And he threads that needle. And I've wondered, you know, if maybe the, uh, refiner's fire of being out in the wilds of Montana, you know, at 2 a.m. in the snow has really whittled away a lot of the stuff that, sure. you know, some of us who live in offices a little bit more try to worry about, oh, do they like me? Like, he does not care. What he cares about is performance. And he gets that out of his folks. And I hope that came through. Well, so you say he cares about performance, but I would also say that he does care about his people. Oh, absolutely. He cares that they are taken care of that they are in a place where they can perform. But yeah, I think the most succinct way that I can put it is that people don't want you to be their friend. They want to be led. Yes. They want to be led. Yeah. And so that is the best thing that you can do for them is to lead them. Yes. And Johnny does it. Like I said, better than almost any I've ever seen. And it was such a treat to bring him on. I've been trying to get him on this podcast for a while. Such a good guy. Yeah, he does not sugarcoat things. He tells it like it is, and people respond to that. And it was really fun to bring this interview to the audience. Yeah. Thank you so much, Johnny. Really appreciate your thoughts, your experience, your leadership persona, and the opportunity that you provided us here to draw those lessons out and share them here with the audience. Anything else, Reed? Nope, that'll do it. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Commission Ed. Commission Ed.